Christmas is a time of joy, a time of giving. At least, that's what everyone expects. In Hamilton, Ontario, friends and colleagues gather to celebrate one woman's achievements. She's a renowned archaeologist who has received a prestigious honor. And she's in love with a man who's not intimidated by her success. Her life is perfect, but not for long. Sometimes, when you least expect it, Christmas is a time when everything gets taken away. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. <laughs> Hamilton police get a call from McMaster University. The dispatcher then alerts Detective Sergeant John Reed. It's been 20 years, but Reed can still remember the call. The phone rang, and I heard that ominous uh, announcement. Sarge, I think we've got a homicide. Immediately, the adrenaline starts flowing, and everything swings into high gear. By the time Detective Reed arrives, the crime scene has already been secured. A janitor at McMaster University has made a terrible discovery. The dead woman is Dora Ferguson, a professor of archaeology. It was quite obvious that fall play was involved. The janitor tells Reed he didn't see Professor Ferguson this morning, but she did call to ask that he turn up the heat in her office. He logged the call in at 10.30. When he came round to check on the heat at 11.30, he discovered the body. We entered the office very carefully to get a brief idea of what had transpired. Reed can see this case is going to be anything but simple. She was lying on the floor, face down, handcuffed, and had tape over her mouth and eyes. Her slacks had been pulled down partially. One of her boots had been removed. There was something uh, of a sexual nature in this, this whole thing. And here we are, broad daylight, a university campus, and something like this happens. How could it happen? It's got to be somebody that knows her. That's the first thing that goes through your mind. This cannot be a random act. Was this a student, colleague, lover? There was so much whirling through your mind right then. Why would somebody kill her? Why? Reed is still working the scene when Professor Marks arrives. He's Dora Ferguson's boyfriend. Marks is determined to find out what happened. Reed gives him the bad news. He was a state of shock. You see him shaking his head and he could tell that he didn't really believe this was happening. But there's little niggling doubts in the back of your mind that maybe this is the person who did it. We don't know. And we're not going to know until we ask questions. Through him, we learned a lot about the victim. She had graduated from Oxford, had a PhD in Roman history, had written books, had been on archaeological digs uh, in Italy and North Africa, and she was very well respected. Mark says the night before the murder, he and Dora had celebrated her election into the Royal Canadian Society. Dora had never seemed happier. Today, they planned to go Christmas shopping. They were supposed to meet at 11 o'clock. He knew that when she's in the office, she always kept the door open. 
He arrives at the office for their, their meeting, and their door's closed and locked. He knocks on the door, knocks on the door. There's no answer. He wasn't overly alarmed. He was a little baffled, because she's a very functional type person. He thought, something's come up. Marks checked to see if any of Dora's colleagues knew where she was. No one had seen her. After you talk to someone long enough, you get certain feelings. There was nothing to indicate this man was lying. And there was everything to indicate he was telling the truth. We did not believe he was in any way involved. Reed now knows that Dora Ferguson was alive at 10.30, nowhere to be found at 11, and dead at 11.30. But he doesn't know what happened in that time frame. Reed decides to check the contents of her purse. We looked through her personal belongings. There was no driver's license, there was no credit card, and it seemed a little unusual. Was this robbery, sexual assault, or premeditated murder? It was very confusing. A lot more questions than answers. Reed hopes the autopsy will help clarify things. Despite the sexual nature of the attack, there is no evidence of sexual assault. But hidden beneath the tape, stuffed inside the victim's mouth, the pathologist finds a rag. She had a medical condition where she couldn't breathe through her nose. So once her mouth had been taped shut, she couldn't breathe. She was asphyxiated. You start to wonder, was this homicide deliberate? The pathologist finds something else peculiar. I did not see any sign of struggle, no injury whatsoever on her body. So that indicated to me uh, something has happened to her to subdue her. Otherwise, I'm sure she would have put up a fight. Dr. Rao asks if police found anything else near the body. One of the uniformed police officers called me and he said, Dr. Rao, there was a green terry towel next to her face. So the first thing came to my mind was chloroform. If chloroform was used, traces would remain in the victim's bloodstream. Dr. Rao orders blood toxicology tests. In our system, there was 1.9 milligram percent of chloroform. That was enough to render a person unconscious. Did the attacker intend to kill her? He certainly came prepared to. With a homicide investigation, it's like that jigsaw puzzle. You have a little piece here, a little piece there, a little piece, and you're trying to fit them in. But at this point, nothing seems to fit. A respected university professor has been murdered. While the attack was sexual in nature, there is no evidence of a sexual assault. The day after the murder, Detective Reed returns to the campus. He finds it deserted. The overwhelming majority of people, and especially from that building, were leaving, going other places for the Christmas holiday. So it just seemed that everything was working against us. Reed interviews the few faculty members who remain. He wants to know if Professor Ferguson had enemies. Professor Clemens says that Dora Ferguson was widely admired. He can't think of anyone who would want to hurt her, but on the morning of the murder, Clemens did see someone strange. A large woman entered his office, but she left before he could ask what she wanted. We also spoke to other people who spotted an unusual looking person wandering around who looked more like a caricature than a real person. So more and more, we started thinking that this unusual-looking person should be questioned in regards to this crime. The problem is, she's nowhere to be found. Reed obtains a search warrant for the dead woman's house. When we searched her home, we found credit card receipts. So this immediately opened up a whole new avenue of investigation. The receipts prove Professor Ferguson had credit cards. The killer must have stolen them. If 
those cards have been used, the police now have a way of tracking her down. Less than 72 hours into the investigation, Detective John Reed gets his first big break. Someone used Dora Ferguson's credit cards right after her murder. The forged signature looks nothing like the professor's. All the store clerks give Reed the same description. Very big person, over 200 pounds. And to many of them, they were saying, it looks like a man dressed up like a woman. The wig. The makeup, of course, women's clothing, but it didn't, it didn't look right. Sometimes you'll, you'll see men who dress up like women, and they do a pretty good job of it. This looked more like a man trying to dress up like a woman and not doing a very good job of it. Well, we started thinking we were looking at uh, a transvestite. Using the store clerk's description, a composite sketch of the suspect is produced, then distributed throughout the Hamilton area. When Reed turns to Hamilton's small transvestite population for help, he's directed to a popular nightclub. These were completely new waters that we were wading into here. We made some contact in the transvestite community, and these people were very helpful. They said, look, we may like to dress up like women. We don't go around killing people. And if we can help you in any way, we will. The transvestite community is close-knit. They all know each other. But nobody has seen anyone who looks like the composite. Maybe the suspect is only using women's clothing as a disguise. The next day, Reed learns that a student has recognized the sketch. She says it's the man who's been stalking her on campus. She finds his lewd remarks disturbing. We asked questions around campus, and we were able to come up with a name. And from that name, we were able to uh, track this person down. The stalker's name is Victor Shelley. If you look at the composite drawing, you look at him, you just said, that's looking pretty good. He admitted, yeah, he sometimes made a nuisance for himself with the girls out there, but he said, well, just the pretty ones. So we focused on him, really focused on him, including doing a search of his premises and everything else. Detective Reed asks the young man for a handwriting sample. He realized what we were doing. He didn't, um, he didn't mind being a suspect. If I can help out, he says, I certainly will. And he did. Expert handwriting analysts compare his notes to the forged receipts. There are no similarities. After a period of time, we realize he may look like it, but it's not him. Reed's only suspect has just been eliminated. Christmas has come and gone. The university is once again filled with students, but Professor Ferguson's murder has not been forgotten. In early January, Reed receives word that someone matching the suspect's description has been spotted on another university campus, 65 kilometers away. Sergeant Dave McCullough is sent to Brock University to investigate. The description, a large, uh, overweight male wearing female attire and looking really bizarre. The police are unable to locate the suspect. Fearful he may strike again, they decide to go public with the investigation. The newspaper article prompts a number of tips, but only one is bizarre enough to make police believe they've finally found their killer. continue to search for a man who wears women's clothes. He may have murdered Professor Dora Ferguson. Now a tip may lead police to his door. One evening, the young lady was home alone. There was a knock at the door, and she opened the door, and there was a person standing there with handcuffs and wearing female attire. And she knew the person. He lived downstairs but uh, she didn't let him in. She slammed the door. The man fits the description. The Brock University suspect was seen wearing the same outfit. 
When she saw the composite sketch in the newspaper, the young woman called police. The suspect is identified as Michael Crowley. He has no police record, not even a traffic ticket. He said, I've been expecting you. I said, oh, really? Why is that? He said, well, it's about this transvestite business in Hamilton. I said, yeah, that's right. And again, being ever diplomatic, I said, look, if you haven't done anything, you have nothing to worry about. And he says, well, I've got nothing to worry about. So I says, fine, we have a search warrant here for your house. In Crowley's apartment, police find a closet full of women's clothes. Crowley admits he's a transvestite. To get into the mind of a suspect, investigators consult with behavioral profilers. Transvestic uh, fetishism is almost exclusively something that heterosexual males engage in, mainly for the purpose of getting some sexual pleasure from it. There were magazines stacked all around the other house. Most of the magazines were of the bondage with uh, women in sexual positions, tied up, gagged with tape, handcuffed. Often sexual bondage material is consistent with somebody who's interested in sexual sadism in that they want to imagine that they can tie somebody up and cause their pain and suffering. But the detectives need more than women's clothing and magazines to prove Michael Crowley is a killer. We searched the house thoroughly, didn't find any credit cards, didn't find any of the stolen items. But McCullough has an idea. So I placed a piece of paper in front of him. I said, uh, I'd like you to write in the victim's name on this piece of paper. My partner was coming up, and I turned to talk to him for a few seconds. And uh, when I turned back, he practically filled the page with the victim's name. I'm not a handwriting expert, but I have to tell you, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And I thought, holy smokes. And he still kept writing. I said, Michael. He said, stop. I took the pen off him. I said, Michael, you killed the lady. And he sort of collapsed and sobbing. I didn't mean to kill him. I didn't mean to kill him. Crowley claims he only intended to rob Dora Ferguson, but police know he came prepared to do far more than that. Quite often, they will try and say that all they were there for was to steal something. Uh, they will downplay the sexual component of it, um, because the sexual component of it to society is much more distasteful than stealing. As Crowley starts to confess, McCullough pieces together what happened on the last day of Dora Ferguson's life. He applied his makeup, uh, his wig, put on the lady's wear. He drove to Hamilton that Saturday morning. He then drove to McMaster, knew his way around McMaster because he'd been there on prior occasions. At 10.30, Professor Ferguson was waiting for her boyfriend. Feeling chilled, she called the janitor to ask that the heat be turned up. Crowley roamed the campus, looking for an opportunity to strike. That I think that was probably all his criteria was that day, is to find a female that he could challenge and control. He was wandering the halls, walked past this office. The door was open. There was a lady sitting there with her back to him, working at a desk. Whenever we see a, a sexual offense uh, between two strangers, the motivation is almost always power or anger. When we're looking at sexual crimes, um, especially ones that are, are committed by a, a fantasy-motivated offender, quite often we'll see their sexually deviant interest come out in that crime. But Crowley didn't get to carry out his sexual assault. The suspect told us while he was in there, there was a knock at the door. Dora. Her boyfriend came and knocked on the door while 
Crawley were still in there. This made Crowley change his plan. He stole Professor Ferguson's credit cards and fled. He had knocked her out with chloroform, gagged her with a towel. It never occurred to him that she might have stopped breathing. So I told him, you're under arrest for murder. And he sat there, still sobbing, reached into his pocket, and he came out with a little glass vial, and he handed it to me. I said, what's this? He said, it's cyanide. He said, I knew you guys would catch me. I said, I was going to take it, but he didn't. People have certain uh, stereotypes of uh, murderers. If you looked at him, he looked completely opposite from anything you would expect. I think he, could, he was ashamed, he was embarrassed, he was sorry. I don't think for one minute it was intended to go as far as it did. Only 24 days after Dora Ferguson's murder, Michael Crowley is arrested. Even if it's accidental, a homicide committed during a sexual assault is treated the same as first-degree murder. Crowley pleads guilty and is sentenced to 25 years. The case is closed, but for someone like Dora Ferguson, it's hard to imagine a less fitting end. What a wonderful person she was, how much she contributed. I mean, whatever she touched turned to gold, except on that sad day. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. 